Hello folks, Silly Moustache here. And once again, and I'd like to talk to you about the principle of opening up or breaking in a guitar or any other musical instrument. This is my Waterloo WL12 that I bought in November 2016. And um, I went out to buy a Gibson guitar of a similar shape. Uh, to a shop that had three or four different uh, L00 type models of Gibsons and none of them spoke to me at all. Uh, there was either something wrong with the presentation, the fit and finish, or the tone, but mostly both. And um, they had these new fangled Waterloo things in. I knew they were connected to Collings and they had a 12 fret one and so this was the one I chose. Well, I got it home and frankly, I sat at home and I thought, well, it's a, a skinnier neck than I'm used to, kind of, uh, used to because it's only one and three quarters, but also I thought, it sounds tinny, sounds thin. Didn't really, sounded better than the Gibsons in the shop, but it didn't really work for me at the time. So what I did was I, thought, well, I'll use it as my working out um, guitar and I'll hang it up as I have done with this guitar for many years. This is my handmade 0028 that was built in 1998, um, which is hanging up uh, in my little office behind me and above um, above us all are great big old-fashioned speakers from the 70s uh, that I've used uh, for mostly for radio for any other music or any other noise that's going on in my in my little study but they're up on a high shelf just below the ceiling and um, when I'm in the office I mostly listen to talk radio BBC talk radio and sometimes there's music on there, uh, not very often. And sometimes I play music, and of course I play stuff off the uh, off off the internet, YouTube things, and stuff like that. Um, and I discovered that this this guitar. Go back to this one again. This guitar um, had rounded up enormously. As you can see, it's a double O shape. It's just Sitka and Indian Rosewood and um, it has enormous fullness. Now you can credit the uh, the builder and you should, you can credit the good woods and you could thank Martin for that. Um, but and also of course the time. It's been hanging on in there for a long time but I'm going to come back to this one now. Bought it in November 2016, found itself up in the, uh, in the office uh, within a month. In January 2017 they told me I had throat cancer and um, I had operations and treatment and stuff like that and I didn't do much playing at all throughout 2017. About a year later um, I took this down and it had changed. Now, was it my, my own perception? Was it my hearing that had changed? Well, all these things are possible. Now, it's a small guitar and it's made of maple back and sides, which isn't the warmest tone wood. But all of a sudden this had, to my ear, developed something more. It had opened up, that's the phrase we use, to my ear. Now another situation that happened to me a few years ago, I had my lovely Lebeda F5 mandolin, which was a great mandolin from the start. And I took it in my mind to have what they call the scoop done. This is the fretboard scooped out here, the frets removed and about an eighth of an inch taken off of that. And I had at that time an excellent uh, luthier friend 
who did all my setups and make guitars and mandolins. And so I asked him to do that. Now the mandolin was a good mandolin when it went in there. But when I went to collect it and played it, I played it for a little while. And I said to Richard, what have you done to the mandolin? He said, what do you mean? I've done exactly what you wanted. Does it not look like... I said, it looks absolutely beautiful. It's perfect. Um, but you've done something else to it. Oh, you put new strings on it. He said, well, um, no, I haven't actually. They're your old strings. What he had done, we decided, that... He'd routed that out, so he'd put this this mandolin on some sort of jig, and he'd cut out all of that lump of ebony, and so the, the mandolin was being resonated like nothing, bounced about while that tool was removing an eighth of an inch or so of ebony. And so by the time he strike, finished it and strung it up again, it was more active. <laughs> Um, Mando Bob, my picking pal, had a lebeder, not totally dissimilar to this, and um, it, uh, these have, by the way, European spruce tops because they were made in Czech Republic. And um, and he worked long and hard with his uh, lebeder mandolin, and then he decided that he wanted a Collings or a Weber mandolin, and he paid an enormous amount of money for his Weber mandolin, which frankly sounded not as good as the Lebeda that he traded in. But over the years since he's bought that, that mandolin has, has improved, as we think that most instruments do. So how do we get them to improve? Why do they improve? What causes them to improve? You know, everybody pays a large amount of money for pre-war guitars, old Martins from the 30s and, and 40s and things like that. Well, of course, it's entirely possible that the poor ones aren't around anymore. And it's only the good ones that, um, that survive because they've been appreciated. But it's also because it's had a number of factors. They've had a lot of resonance and a lot of um, playing, of course. And um, they've, they've gone through getting hot, getting cold, getting damp, getting dry, all that sort of thing, and survived. The ones that survived are the good ones, hopefully. I'll share another little experience. Um, I once found out that there was a man in North London that was selling a 60s D45. He said, in perfect condition, never been played. What? So, um, Nanny Jane and I went along to this a uh, house that looked a, a little bit like something out of the Adams family and he showed me this D45 that he'd bought as a wedding present for his wife who had taken one look at it and put it away and never played it. The strings were green. I took the guitar out and played it um, after struggling to get it into some sort of tuning and it sounded like cardboard. I explained to him that the strings were hopelessly dead and corroded and it was a Sunday and it was some time ago we, you couldn't just go and buy a set of strings on a Sunday and so we agreed that he would get another set of strings, have them put on, because he didn't know how to, have them put on and I would come back the following Sunday, which I did, and so it had a nice new set of Daquisto strings for some reason, I don't know why but that was alright, and I played it, tuned it up and it was still dead. That guitar had been in the case since he bought it in the late 60s and it had no quality of sound whatsoever. Um, it was not cracked, it was not damaged, it was not used, but it, it needed to be brought out of itself. It had not been resonated, it had been dead wood lying in a case. Um, I didn't buy the D45. It, I might have been able to bring it to life. Ways that we can bring the guitar to life are often discussed 
And of course, the best way to do it is to play it. But the other way to do it is have it hanging up where it is resonating. There's an old idea in the 70s we used to say the best thing to do with the new guitar is leaning up against your speaker and play rock music at it. Um, and I do believe that works and I believe that's what worked with this one and uh, my Waterloo in my little office because when I'm in there the radio's on. So often the radio's on when I'm not in there. So they, they're always moving, they're always resonant. If I suddenly switch the radio off, I can hear my instruments um, resonating for a while. One of the ways uh, that, w that has been made available to us in recent years is by a product called that, the Tone Right. And I have a Tone Right, and it, here it is fitted on my... Um, one of my guitars that certainly doesn't need any uh, tone writing or resonating. Of course, another thing is if a guitar has been used and then isn't used for a long time, um, it can go to sleep. And that's a term that I have used before. Um, I had a, oh, the gentleman that made this for me had a secret room full of vintage Martins. And once he showed me a 1930-something uh, Martin D28. As pride of his collection, you know, his pension fund sort of thing. And um, he took it out and um, we went into his workshop and we played it. Meh, nothing. It had gone to sleep. So with this thing, this is actually vibrating now, but you can't really hear it. But if I, with controls... You can feel it, I, I can feel it, and you can probably hear it vibrating. Now, I have used this facility on guitars that I have bought used, but unplayed, shall we say. And um, I stand them on a tripod in my workshop and um, switch that right off. This is the Mark I tone, right? So um, it's either on or off, really. Uh, <clears throat> and I've put them on a tripod in there and I've left them there for a week, two weeks, three weeks and perceived something of an improvement not a radical, not a magical improvement <clears throat> I actually believe that um, different woods, different guitars, different builds uh, will take different times to open up some never will and some will be exactly as you hear them when you play them in the shop as a new guitar um, and uh, that's why I, uh, I don't really believe that um, you should judge an instrument purely by the sound it makes when you first pick it up in a shop, especially if it hasn't been on display and um, listened to Stairway to Heaven for a million times. Uh, I do believe that as the owners of guitars, especially fine guitars, we have a duty to work them in ourselves. Uh, someone who will play a guitar very, very gently. take a lot longer to open up a guitar than someone like me, heavy-handed, heavy-fisted. But I think it is um, a collection of ver different variables. Um, most of my guitars have Sitka tops. This um, Collings that I have here is an Adirondack top. I'm going to take this tone right off, master noise, um, and this was built in 2003 and had worked hard from, if you look at the, the back and things like that, and it's had electrics put into it, it worked hard before I got it, uh, so it was, a I believe, a professional musician's guitar for some time. Uh, a little bit worn on the frets and things like that, so you could see the signs of use. But an extra, e an excellent guitar. I do believe that Adirondack 
being a stiffer wood, um, takes a bit longer to open up than Sitka. There's nothing wrong with Sitka, there's nothing wrong with Adirondack, there's nothing wrong with European spruce or any of those, but they have different qualities and they'll have different qualities from tree to tree and they'll certainly have different qualities from environment and the person that plays them. But if you want a guitar to sound the way you like it, you get the right product, you get the right materials in that product and then you put the work in it yourself. Yes, listening to the radio all day long will help a guitar. Um, a tone right will help a guitar. Um, and, um, and all sorts of other things. Yamaha have a process called ARE, and I don't know what that stands for, but it basically it's vibrating the guitar before they sell them. And I'm sure that opens up um, guitars. Uh, the reasons that people now buy guitars with torrified tops, and that probably appeals more to people of, um, of great age, like me, who know that they can't wait another 20 years to get uh, their guitars to fully open up. So they have that baked top, which dries out the tone wood and, and maybe makes it more resonant. I don't know all the details about that, but it seems to be quite a popular thing that most of the makers are using now as an extra option. It also makes the wood look a little bit older, which is always nice. So, where am I? Where am I? Chris Martin once came over to the UK to hold some road shows, and I went to one in Brighton, and I remember him saying, when you buy a new Martin guitar, that's the worst it's ever going to sound. I believe that's true. Um, I believe Martin were very cute in 1934, when they stopped making guitars that were balanced across the strings and put a bass bias in, in their dreadnoughts, certainly, and then other things. Because if people pick up a new guitar and they hear the bass, they will think, ah, oh, yes. And they will pay more focus to that than the clarity of the treble. It will all equalize and, and come together. Collings keeps that old thing of balanced strings, so people think, oh, well, they're a bit tinny, a bit trebly. No, they're a bit equal, balanced. And most of us, let's face it, have been brought up with the sound of um, Martin guitars, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, there we go, just some thoughts. Um, I hope you found that interesting. I would love to see your comments and your queries about this. Uh, underneath, so please do that. And uh, so, if you thanks for watching, bye.